Luke Bell. Um, I guess previously professional athlete for about 20 years, mainly in the, the Ironman long course scene. Um, studied exercise science and, and teaching through university and currently am working for Triathlon Victoria as the athlete pathway manager or, or predominantly dealing with the, the junior up and coming athletes um, in Victoria and you know liaising with their, their coaches, parents and families to try and I guess help them have a life that you know myself and further down the line here you get to hear that, that Nolsey sort of had as well. Um, yeah, my background is similar to Belly. It's a professional triathlon way back in the 90s. But um, these days I'm full-time coaching. Um, my company is Jarra Sport and we run online plus squad programs. Um, and uh, yeah, we've uh, got Tiago on board now as well, who's, who's joined as a another coach and uh, uh, until COVID things were moving really lovely and like everyone we're just working out ways to move forward uh, including swimming and uh, dry land programs. Yeah hi Andre Bredovic I'm uh, I'm probably the oldest in the group I'm 55 I'm an age group uh, triathlete and coach, so I race 70.3 distance predominantly, and I coach individuals uh, in different places all around the world, all virtually, do hardly any face-to-face -face, uh, triathlon coaching, um, but I predominantly work as a health coach, helping people lose weight and work on their longevity pathways using a, a wide range of um, lifestyle practices and supplementation programs, so um, I'm a development coach with Trivic, uh, do some mentoring on some of the coaching courses and I am quite big into gym and strength training. So that's one of the reasons I'm on the call. I'm Brenton Ford from Effortless Swimming. Uh, I have a, I'm from a sort of national level swimming background and have been coaching for the last 13 years and predominantly working with adults to help them improve their technique. And we run a lot of clinics and camps around the country and uh, do a lot of underwater filming and analysis. So uh, mostly coaching these days and uh, working with a with a heap of triathletes. So, um, with the with the strength stuff, um, yeah, what we're going to look at today is is what people can do without a pool and uh, and to keep a little bit of their swim fitness and strength so that, that when they can get back in the water, uh, they can get back there. Without it's a unique unique situation. Um, I guess for me, dealing predominantly with juniors at the minute with the TVDP program, it's it's more of trying to ensure that you know it's hard to make sure kids aren't overtrained to start with um you, you've got to be very careful of their loads and what they're doing as well but in this time it, it's more trying to liaise i guess with their coaches and wonder um or I'll make sure that they're not or they're doing things correctly but not obviously over overloading as well so it's you know making the use of time but not subbing out a swim session as such for you know a, as we've chatted about earlier, you know, an hour and a half band session. It's just, you know, it's just not good for the body. Um, so I'd be interested to, you know, to hear from the other guys. So if we go down the line, you know, Brenton, Nolsey and Andre, um, just a, a different activity or, or something different or unique that, you know, you, you've had to implement in um, now that people aren't able to use the, you know, they're still able to use the oceans, but not necessarily able to use the pools. Uh, yeah, so... Um, I mean, every, everyone's going to lose their swim, their swim fitness without being able to, to swim. So once you can take that on board and know that, uh, that everyone's in the same boat, I think we look at, all right, what's the, what's the option from here? And I think there's, there's two main things that I've been looking at. One is you can certainly improve the, the technique and the movements that you're doing. So with the band stuff that we'll talk about working on your, on a better catch there, and uh, primarily working on that is going to help people going forwards, but also better movements in terms of uh, better control and, uh, and being more connected through the movements. So one of the things that we look at in, in swimming is in order to, to swim well, you want to swim from the inside out, which means it sort of starts in the middle of your body with your core, through your hips, and then you can have that, that power and control come out to the extremities through the arms and legs. And one of the things that we see a lot of is because you're in the water, it's a very hard environment to be uh, to connect everything up well. But 
with that better connection, you can swim so much faster for a lot less effort. So through some good dry land movements, uh, you can really develop that. And, uh, and a good way to develop, develop it can be using mirrors, uh, can be doing some exercises that you may not have done before. But it's, it's that sort of stuff that I'll be looking to work on in order to, um, to make the most of the time where you're forced to spend it out of the water. Great. Yeah, look, I agree with Brenton. Um, mirrors in particular are something that I've used in the past, really working on that, uh, that high catch piece. But um, also, you know, there's so many variations. You can work with swim bands over your head, lying down. Um, you can isolate areas, the, the back end of the catch. You can ensure that forearm is vertical towards the, the ground as you're pressing through. Um, and you can change your position and vary the movement patterns just by doing slight changes in, in angle, whether it be through the arm uh, pressing to the back or whether it be on the catch where the fingers are pressing over early for a higher elbow. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of fun to be had. You've just got to experiment as well. But at the same time, you know, get the movement patterns right before you start uh, heading into the, the harder sets and reps. Andre. Um, I won't talk too much about the band work. I'll leave that to the swim experts. I'd focus more on the strength training aspect. And whenever we get to that, I'll share my points there. But I would say, um, <clears throat> as an example, for my own programming, I've put in you know, I used to swim, I was only swimming four days a week, but I've put in 15 minute blocks on the same days for uh, band work and a certain amount of time for gym work. So in terms of scheduling, so we keep some sort of routine, I would strongly suggest not talking about the technical aspects, but about the planning aspects is allocate time where you would be swimming for that hour and a half take some of that time, maybe even on the same days that maybe get a bit of a sleep in because you probably need a sleep in, but later on in that morning, allocate the time and go down and do the things that Simon and Brenton will talk about around band work, work, band work with technique and a bit of strength, but also then make that time available to do some strength training. But as, as the guys have said, not for an hour and a half. So I've allocated 15 minutes on my swim days to do some technical work and about 15 minutes to do specific strength work. So I, I think that's, I think that's actually quite an interesting point, Andre. So from that, we can actually start getting people into some really good habits so that when normal life resumes that they've naturally incorporated some of the strength and conditioning work into their uh, routines because they've been practicing practicing it during this uh, self isolation period. Is, is, is that a fair fair thing to say? Well, well, well. You know, when we are when our whole life changes, and you know, mentally, a lot of people will be mentally struggling with this not being able to swim, right? Plus, not being able to go out, and maybe people don't have a gym at home. You know, I've got a gym at home. I use indoor training heaps, so I'm not struggling as much. But when we struggle, it's good to have some routine. So I would highly recommend for mental mental health and keeping a routine and having good habits. We we associate well. I can't get to the pool. Yes, I can get to a beach, but my swimming training has now changed for six months or three months and it's going to be probably not wearing my funky trunks in the garage doing band training or gym training. I'm going to wear a tracksuit, but this is my swim training and I need to accept that and acknowledge that. And I'm going to get stronger by actually doing this stuff and build it into a routine, put it in train, like mine, I use today's plan. All my swim training is now in today's plan as a week, you know, four days a week at 7.15, I'm in the garage and I'm doing my swim training. And that's what I've accepted I'm doing. And I think people, for people's health and well-being and mental health, maybe thinking like that, just accepting instead of saying, oh shit, I can't go to the pool. You can't change it. But what you can change is your thought and your approach to training for swimming. 
I think that's a, you know, it's a very good point too. It's, you know, r- routine provides balance in people's lives and, you know, you, you come back and, and, and similar as well with some of the athletes that um, I've been dealing with also is you, you look at what you can do, not what you can't do. You know, it's, it comes back to, you know, going, you know, looking more towards positives than negatives and you, you accept that and you plan around that. But the, the whole normality and setting it in your weekly or, you know, fortnightly program as well, you know, the, the flip, there's a couple of points that I find interesting there is, you know, one, it's obviously visually in front of you of, of what you have to do and knowing what you're doing. So it provides purpose to your training. But then two, having it in the program, you're not waking up daily and going, oh, you know, I probably should do some swim cords again today. Um, and before, you know, you could have done six or seven days in a row of swim cords, which again is, you know, it's not progressive overload. Um, that is just pure overloading. So by having it scheduled in your weekly or fortnightly program as well, you know, you're decreasing that chance of injury as well because you're maintaining that that overall training balance still. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know, some fantastic points in there that are, you know, are very well worth noting. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's about uh, controlling the controllables. And it's funny, you know, we use these terms in, in racing and, and they, they can go into life as well. Um, and just uh, understanding the routine is key to, uh, you know, building, patterns and structures that you can stick with and you can build and grow from. And um, from that, you're going to gain satisfaction. You're going to gain mental health. And uh, I just, I just think that routine uh, that Andre was speaking of is is just so important. It's actually probably number one. Well, well, uh, just a couple of things for me, I would firstly, um, uh, firstly, the coach should be giving our athletes guidance, but you know, maybe some people are self-coaching. I'd be saying, what is my experience in doing uh, strength training? Like, I, I, I would imagine many triathletes don't do much strength training. They just focus on swim, ride, run. If they are doing strength training, it would be, you know, what have I done before and where am I starting from before I start moving into doing, you know, a whole range of strength training you know whether it's just body weight work or whether it's actually using weights where am i starting from because that should determine you know what do i do and also have i got any uh weaknesses with shoulder so brenton so you're i guess you're the unique one here is you're not directly i guess coaching athletes one-on-one as such um you know it's a bit more of i guess correct me if I'm wrong, you know, you do a bit more consult stuff, um, technique stuff, but a lot of online stuff. What sort of, I guess, whether it be, you know, video footage or, you know, obviously during this different time, what sort of stuff have you been sending out athletes that you've been in contact with? Yeah, one of, uh, I did a training on it last week about uh, some things that people can do to, to keep going during this time. Um, if we look at, I guess, what's some, uh, what's some equipment, some basic equipment that people could, could all start with? Um, a TheraBand would probably be the first thing. Um, I normally recommend a, uh, a red TheraBand, which is a fairly light to, uh, resistance, or you might move up to a green one for a few different exercises. But uh, I'd recommend probably that and maybe some resistance tubes. Again, going lighter than what you think. So I've had a number of people message me and they ask, should I get the, uh, the green or the red um, they're looking. They were looking at the finish um, resistance bands, and I'm I'm using the the lowest, uh, the the least resistance one. And even then, I can only do 200 to 300 reps in total for the day before I'm completely fatigued. Um, and that's with a, a lifetime of, of swimming background. So I think most people seem to be going for something that's too thick. Uh, and as you're talking about before, that is going to just lead to to injury. So I think the very first thing with that is um, get, yeah, get some light resistance bands and TheraBands. Um, and you know, aside from that, maybe an exercise mat as well, just to start working on some, um, on some uh, core exercises and, uh, and just some body weight exercises. There's certainly a lot of other stuff you can get, but I mean, that stuff might set you back $30, $40 and that will, um, that'll start you off uh, really well and 
you're not you're very unlikely to injure yourself just with those with those basics. And uh, I know Andre's got a lot more experience with the uh, the exercises that where we're looking at squats and deadlifts and and that sort of stuff. But um, I'd be looking at what what equipment can most people uh, start with. So, and to give people, I guess, a, a perspective of you know, you, you mentioned two odd hundred reps, um, which two hundred for for the average person sounds a lot. How long, say, in time frame, would it take you to do two hundred reps? Yeah, so I've, I've just been breaking it down. Um, so, I've, basically, three times a week for me, I've just been doing some some strength training. Uh, the other days, I've been doing um, running and riding that sort of thing. Uh, I normally break it down into lots of 50. So we're talking uh, left arms one, right arms two. So 50 uh, freestyle pull throughs, and then I'll alternate with double arms. So your butterfly movement. So it'd be four to six sets of 50 with the bands that I've got. Uh, there are some lighter ones where I could probably do eight to 10 reps of that, but I wouldn't want to be doing too much more uh, than that. So at the end of it, my, my technique's starting to fall apart. And uh, I can feel that it's not doing anything to benefit me. It's only going to make me um, just lose form. And just like when you're training, you don't want to go too far to that point where you're practicing bad habits and bad technique. Um, and that, that point is going to be different for everyone. But I would just start with really light therabands and get the technique right, where we're looking at two things with the therabands or the resistance tubes that, that most people tend to do. One is obviously dropping the elbow during the catch. So as best you can try and keep the upper arm in the same position while the hand and forearm drop down. So we want that high elbow catch and Simon's got his, uh, his, his bands there. And the last <laughs> one is the um, out the back. So as, as you're pressing back past the hips and we see this a lot when we're running camps and we take people through it is a lot of people finish too wide. So their hands are 15, 20 centimeters wide of their hips, get the, elbows in close to the side of the body through the last part so that you're using your triceps through that last part of the the stroke so they're the two main mistakes that i see made so if you can get those two things right it's going to cover um yeah, it's going to cover most of your bases yeah look I, I thought i'd just show what the swim bands look like that i'm using and it's just a, a normal hand pedal just putting one finger through and uh for me, a lot of people hook them up uh, really low. I like hooking them up high above the door and it actually gives a little bit of uh, a shoulder and lat stretch just as you're holding. So it's not, like, it's not exactly like swimming. That It's about the mo mobility piece as well and also just opening up those shoulders so you can get a full stroke. Um, for me, the sessions are 45 minutes long. And the first 10 minutes is literally isolation work um, and feeling the stretch from the, uh, the, the swim bands. Um, so some, some of the types of uh, work that I do are avoiding prime movers and starting to work in those areas that are gonna really stabilize the rotator cuff. And that can include uh, infraspinatus, supraspinatus, teres minor, um, all those intricate areas around the posterior chain that ensure that the shoulder is stabilised and doing its job correctly. Um, once that's finished, I start isolating on high elbow work with the bands and just actually holding in a single position so people can feel that high elbow away from the body. Um, and only then do I really begin a main set of right arm, left arm, both arms, and moving that around from over the top of the head to on the floor, um, and having rest intervals with um, isolation movements in between. So I guess that's the breakup. Obviously, there's a cool down without the bands, and it's just onto floor exercises, um, uh, child pose up dog, down dog, that sort of thing, just to have a gentle stretch out and uh, complete the session. I guess the other interesting point, which would be to, you know, would be the next step on, on the different types of activities you do is then obviously um, everyone sort of deals with a, a broad range of athletes from a, you know, complete newbie novice to triathlon through to, you know, the, the advanced athlete that's done 
30 Ironmans, um, you know, that sort of been there and done it forever sort of thing, um, to the elite level juniors as well. Um, what, what sort of different things is, are, are each of you doing, I guess, to accommodate for, you know, obviously we, we can all do swim cords and that, but if, if you're a complete newbie to the sport, do you do it slightly different to what, what a more advanced and 20, 30 year veteran in the sport of triathlon does? Well, like therabands, uh, swim bands come in different resistance as well. Um, so, you know, you can work it to the, the individual's needs, I guess. But look, inevitably, the, the sessions I'm running on Zoom are in a group uh, environment. So you are a little limit, limited to working one-on-one. But um, it's just about slowing those movement patterns down. And, you know, as Brenton mentioned earlier, grabbing a mirror if you can and really checking uh, form as you're you're pressing through, have the mirror in front of you. You can have it side on as well. Um, And that can really help with ensuring that you've got correct form and you're staying away from any type of injury. If you do this stuff correctly, honestly, it should make, uh, make you stronger and, you know, more resilient to any uh, possible injury. And, um, you, you know, with time, I think form improves. I mean, I saw myself on video for the first session and realised how low the, the elbow was dropping so early. I, I didn't realise that. And... Uh, so you recalibrate for the next session and uh, and improve. It's just like any training; you keep at it, you'll uh, you'll get better. I'm yeah. getting my athletes, Luke, to um, send me videos on Messenger, and you know, once they nail that, it doesn't take a lot of work to go back and say, yeah, keep the change this, change that. Um, and in the programs I write, I actually put videos of the ex- links to the videos of the exercises in today's plan, so they can just click on it and look at it. Um, so that's one thing I'm doing. And, and as Simon said, using different theraband resistance levels. But it's the same with the other exercise. So whether you're doing flutter kicks or supermans or squats or chin ups or pull ups or push ups rather or tricep work, you know, off a chair. I'm using video a lot, which I do anyway, but even now it's a really good way to look at technique and assess things. And it can be on messenger. It can be on some other sort of app. It's very fast and easy and it gives people very direct, fast, quick feedback. Yeah. I think nowadays, you know, everyone's phones, (laughs) unfortunately, um, are generally within half an arm's reach. Um, And again, like, as you mentioned, it's instant feedback and, I think Robbie will ensure that there will be links um, provided with this as well so people can see some different types and, yeah, again, a variety of exercises to do. But, yeah, that, that being able to, you know, whether it be a mirror as Brenton and Nolsey talked about, um, you know, at worst you can also you set up your phone, record yourself doing the exercise and, again, within, you know, 10 seconds you've got that instant feedback as well. Is it actually during the motion of the exercise, no, but you know, it's probably the next best thing that you can do an exercise and within 10 seconds you go back and as Nolsey sort of said as well, you can, you can adjust, recalibrate and you know, if you're slightly dropping the elbow, then you go, okay, that last time, um, this is what I want to focus on this time. I want to make sure my elbow is slightly higher, still keep that, you know, wrist below the elbow and, and go forward. Brendan, do you, like, it, do you use that that self video analysis much in the stuff that you do as well? Yeah, so we I coach a, a lot of athletes online. But they'll send me videos of them swimming, and then I give them uh, give them feedback and and give them things to focus on after that. And a lot of times, people will so they'll come back after two or three weeks. They'll re-record and they'll look at it before they send it to me, and they'll go, "Oh, I thought I was making this change, but I can see that I'm I'm not." And then they'll often go back again make the change and then they'll, they'll look at it. So I'd say, yeah, more times than not, probably 75% of the time when someone thinks they're doing, uh, making a change or they're, or they're doing something often they're often they're not, it's just how, how it is, uh, especially with anything that's swimming related. So if you, if you can do that video, you get that feedback and you can make a change. And 
uh, some things that I've seen with, um, with swimmers that I've coached who are, who are very good swimmers, if they're doing it with the TheraBand or the resistance tubing, a, a couple of things that mistakes that even some really good swimmers will make is um, they'll often bend their wrist too much. So their hand and forearms not connected as, as one paddle. So keep that as one paddle. Make sure that you're not too much up, up here with your shoulders. So a lot of people, when they go for that high elbow position, they try and um, keep it very, very high up and it puts their shoulder in a very awkward position. So make sure that you, you do go down enough where you are in a much more uh, controlled position and you're not too much where you're hunching up and the elbows are up even above your shoulders sometimes is what we see. So that's going to cause a lot of, uh, that's, that's it's a good chance of that leading to injury. Um, and a lot of people try and just go too fast and too quick of it. So when we swim, we want movements to be slow to fast. So you're going to start out slow at the front and be a little bit quicker at the back. And it should be somewhat similar when you're doing these stretch cord exercises as well. So often people will just be in too much of a rush. If you can control the movement, then as Nolsey was talking about, just going through it very slowly and just getting the technique right, uh, that's going to uh, be a much better approach than just trying to get through those 50 reps as quickly as possible. And then Andre and Nolsey, I'll, I'll jump back to you guys quickly. Obviously, you know, we've, we've talked about performing the, these exercises now, but you, you don't want to just jump in and straight, straight away start ripping into some cords or, or TheraBands and that as well. Um, what ways, I guess, and again, coming back to you guys, because you, you're more focused on the, the group coaching and the, you know, um, one-to-one triathlon coaching as such. How do you integrate a warm-up into that to obviously avoid injury? Do you get people to, whether it be, you know, jump on a bike for five minutes, skip for, um, you know, skipping is a, a great form of exercise as well. Benefits cross over for running, cardio, or, you know, do you get people to go for a run? How do you get people warmed up so they don't just jump in and start, you know, ripping into the cords. So whether it's whether it's band work or the more more body weight strength work, <clears throat> I use the same approach. And that would be, and even for my own training, is I either get on my treadmill uh, or I go outside. If I had a gym, I'd be doing a erg uh, five five to seven minutes just to warm the body up uh, in terms of getting the heart rate up a little bit, warming the muscles up, and then. I would always do sort of like what I call a self check-in. So as I say, whether it's, you know, a solid band session or a strength training session with body weights, I do a small subset of the exercises I'm going to do, but not at sort of a higher load. Just to check, um, I, if it's push-ups, I might do four or five push-ups just to check that my shoulders are feeling good, making sure my body positions correct with my hand under my shoulders make sure my back's not sore my lower back's not sore if I'm doing squats and you take this approach into other exercises is I would do some body weight squats where I'm not going all the way down to the floor to check are my knees feeling good is there any twinges anywhere so I would always recommend apart from doing a five to seven minute warm up to get the heart rate up and get the muscles warm is doing a small subset of the exercises before going to full load or maximum um, power, so to speak, to check and ask yourself, am I sore anywhere? Am I, have I got any twinges? But also, uh, am I motivated to do this workout? Because often, as you all know, you know, lack of motivation can mean we're overtrained or we're fatigued. So I'd be thinking about those things before I go in to do the work. And then crucially on the first set of each exercise, not going to, you know, the typical RPE or load we would for a full set as a extra check with the weight or, you know, load that you're doing to make sure you're ready to do the work. And that's probably more relevant to body weight work or weight based work. I'd like to see what Simon says about how you'd progress into band work. Cause that's probably more, you know, that's not as much of the work I do. Right. Well, it's the same, same rules apply. Um, for me, the warm up uh, consists less of, you know, getting on an erg or, or treadmill and just uh, getting into the isolation work. And as you said, Andre, just feeling the different, uh, muscle groups you know checking on how the pec is recruiting how the the lats and traps whether that you can feel your back and getting a little bit of burn through the deltoids 
Um, and then from there, with the sets and reps, really it's, and, and this is every time with swim bands, it's a progression. So the sets start out easy and it works up. And I guess, you know, you could call that a preset. It's, it's, it's a warm up into the main set, but I guess I call it, it's still a part of that 30 minutes. Um, and from there, look, admittedly, um, once you start speeding things up, form throws away a little bit. Uh, so it's a good idea just to head back to some slow movement patterns. Uh, and also, you know, moving it around from standing to lying on your back to overhead type movements. Um, and it's also giving your body a recalibration and reset to start a, a main set again. And the main one really is standing for me and um, double arm, single arm, alternating. Uh, a lot of butterfly, um, but there is a little extra stress through the shoulders on that movement pattern. I like one arm because you can pull your shoulder down and off to the side a little bit and just uh, open up the shoulders and press off to the um, back of the stroke with a little more ease. So um, I guess uh, my hints for you know creating a main set around swim bands, um, obviously, you know, if you've got time, get something lighter like TheraBands. And again, you know, do the shoulder flexion, external rotation, internal rotation, all those um, minor movement patterns before starting a main set. And I'll, uh, I've got a, a video of just some basic TheraBand exercises that people can do. This is a five minute routine that I do every time before I swim, every time before I train two reasons one is to increase strength and number two is just to warm up the shoulders before we get going before a training session so the first thing I like to start with you'll need a TheraBand uh, I like the red color this kind of resistance this amount of resistance is right for most people so the first exercise I'll start with is reverse flies so I double it over hands about shoulder width apart and then keeping the shoulders set back so bring your shoulder blades your scapulas back and down keep those back while you keep your arms straight bring it out and then back to center. And what we're looking for here is that squeeze between the shoulder blades once you get to this position. So I normally go through 10 to 15 of these to start with, so 10 to 15 reverse flies. The next thing I go on to is internal and external rotation, which you've probably seen before. So going with external rotation, we want to set the shoulder back, shoulder down, elbow in line with your shoulder keeping this straight and we want to lift up and we just go through that slowly and the aim is to try and keep the bottom part of the arm completely still. We've seen that from another direction, all right, on this side. So I'll normally go through 10 to 15 of those on one side, 10 to 15 on the opposite. All right, then we want to swap over. Then we want to go to internal rotation. So exactly the same move, movement. Sitting the shoulders down and back, elbows in line with the shoulder, and moving down in that direction. So you want to keep the arm at 90 degrees as you do it. It's not like you're building a lot of muscle here. It's more about stability and control through your scapula. The next one I like to do is standing on the TheraBand. I grab about 30 centimetres from the top, all right, and I stand up, and what we're looking to do here is work the opposing muscles. So we take a couple thousand strokes when we're swimming, pulling in that direction. It can be good to balance that out, build up the opposing muscles. So starting here, I want to lift up, keep the elbows and the hands in line to begin with, and pull up to the top, and come back down. But I'll normally do that quite a bit quicker, like that. So you're going to start to feel a little bit of you might feel a few niggles through the shoulder on top here while you get used to it, but that's all right. After a week or two, that'll start to reduce and you'll start to build muscles in the opposing direction, okay, which is just good for, for balance. The next one I like to do is work in the recovery muscles. So recovery is when you're coming over the top here. And I got this one from Miguel Lopez, who's the FINA coach at Tempura. He got this from one of the bio uh, mechanists at um, one of the world champs. And, um, what they like to do is, same thing, you want to grab it with one hand, 
stand on the ethereal band, lift, or not lift, turn through your hips, so open up through one hip, then you're kind of like going to come over the top quickly in that position. Because again, we use this, we build a lot of muscle power that way, but one thing that a lot of people don't get to work is that recovery. And we want a high octane, we want a fast, speedy and strong recovery over the top. So in that direction. Again, 10 to 15 on each side. Make sure that you rotate your hips to begin, and then come over the top with a straight arm and land there. What I don't want you to do is lift up in this direction because that's gonna put a lot of pressure on your shoulder. So make sure that you come around enough to keep within your natural range of motion as you do it. 10 to 15 there, same on the other side. And then the, the next one, probably my favorite one, is, uh, is working the, the catch, working the muscles that really you've, you've got to keep strong when you're beginning the catch. So I like to lean over, all right, not a huge amount of pressure to start with. I want you to start with the arms straight, and then one at a time, bend down, keep the forearm and the hand completely straight, all the elbow stays forward, and then we just want to push back to there, come back, swap arms. So top of the arm stays where it is, forearm and hand down, flat, completely vertical, press back, past the shoulder. And what you'll find after doing this for, for several weeks is that catch position that we ideally want to try and get to becomes a lot easier to maintain. One, because you've got better awareness around how, how you actually maintain that position as you pull through. And secondly, you've got the, the strength and the control through the back of the shoulders here to be able to do it because that's something that a lot of people they don't build up enough to be able to hold that position or put any pressure on as they go through it. So that's probably my favorite one, but that's just a simple five minute routine that you can do uh, before you train that uh, will make a big difference when it comes to less injuries and strength for swimming. Warm up with before a, a swim session is just this, it's like a five minute routine with the TheraBand. So uh, that's, that's a good way to, to get, the, you know, get the, the blood flowing, especially through the shoulders. Um, another thing that a lot of people have asked about is swim tethers. So if they've got a pool in their backyard, then they've been buying either, you can either strap it around your waist or there's ones that will connect to your, your ankles that's going to put even more load on your shoulders than a lot of the, the resistance tubes or the cords. Um, it's certainly not a bad thing to be doing, but again, I, I reckon it's something that I, I see people going a little bit too hard with and doing too much of in the beginning. So uh, with those swim tethers in the backyard pool, go really light, especially at the start. And uh, 15 minutes on, on the swim tether is probably going to feel like a 45 minute session normally just because of the, because you're not, uh, you're not actually moving through the water. So uh, again, I'd even just the stuff that we're talking about here with the swim cords, double it for the swim tethers, uh, because even very good swimmers I've seen using them are um, saying how their, their shoulders are starting to hurt. So you just, you don't want that. Yeah, very, you know, very, very valid point because, you know, obviously <laughs> everyone lives on social media these days and the number of people putting up, yes, as you said, swimming in backyard pools, whether it be with an old bike tube or um, the, the specific tethers for swimming in, in pools, it's most people would assume that this is going to be better for them and, and not as demanding on the body where, you know, ultimately it's, you know, it's a, it's a bit more demanding on the body than um, actually doing the dry land stuff itself, which, yeah, super valid point. And another thing with that too is with the swim tethers, probably more so with the ones around your waist, but you're, you're not going to be rotating as much either. You're a little bit more limited with your, your reach through the shoulders. And again, it can just put you in that position where, it can really cause you a little bit of damage up top here. So um, it's another thing that people need to be mindful of is you just can't get in the same positions that you would uh, without the tethers on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. it feels like I've, I've done a little bit of stationary swimming and it feels like you're just muscling it. Mm. And it's very hard to get any length or form. Um, sure, you'll get some strength out of it, whether it crosses over into swimming. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I personally feel... Uh, dry land work is probably more powerful, but um, you know, I mean, it's still a valid uh, training tool. I'm just not sure if you'd want to do it every week for anything much longer than you know, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, no, what I've been, uh, 
Yeah, I, I certainly, I think anything more than 15 minutes is, is probably more than what you need. And something I've been recommending to people who, who do want to use it is in between your sets, you can do some either kicking against the wall and preferably with the snorkel on. So you can certainly work on your kicking uh, and also some sculling just with the, the band on. Great way to keep your, your feel for the water and uh, it's not going to put any strain on the shoulders. I guess during this time as well, with everyone jumping into to more of the, the dry land stuff as well, do you all put a little bit of extra emphasis on stretching or joint mobility as well? Because obviously these activities are going to be quite new to the athletes. Um, and we all know if we, we haven't done lunges in a while and we go and do five lunges, the next day we can't walk down a set of stairs. So, like, is there an extra emphasis or making the, the athletes or, or your athletes wary that, okay, they, these are different and new to you. So the outcome will be you may feel tighter, sore, um, your range of motion may be less. So obviously increasing that chance of injury as well. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts there? I think it's about giving options um, and, you know, obviously allowing people to decide when they feel it's getting too hard. Um, so whether it's, you know, a simple push up that's on the knees or on the, on the toes, you know, there's, there's so many variations on every single exercise that, that includes for swim bands. Um, you know, you can, you can uh, walk out and tighten them or you can uh, release a little bit and just take off the tension. So, I think there's many options for people to work around uh, their limitations in regard to strength or, or time uh, on, the, on new exercises. Yeah, I, I always give people uh, a basic, I, when I write a program in today's plan for the gym, it's like basic and there's a link to a basic video and it prescribes what they need to do and then if they're feeling really good or we talk about it, they simply go to the advanced one and that's a video with the progression. Um, and generally we always start people on the basic work, but it, I think it's important that they build this connection between if they haven't done this type of work before, they really need to connect with their body about what's going on and accept as Simon says that if it's new, they might be sore and not have that typical attitude that some triathletes do of pain is good or go hard or go home because that's how they'll injure themselves, especially if this is new to them. They need to ease into it um, and listen to what their body's saying and, and have appropriate breaks. So, you know, typically I'd be saying no more than three times a week doing strength training, maybe doing the band work more often, but I'm talking about doing, you know, tricep work, push-ups, pull-ups, push-ups, a whole range of more body weight work three times a day and never day, you know, always with a day in between. And if they get to the second day in the second week and they're still really sore, well, then they just do some yoga or some stretching and they don't worry about doing the session, but really connecting with what they're, how their body is coping, if it's, especially if it's new. Well, Ozzy, how, how often are you running the Jarrah Sports sessions um, with, with your group as well? You, you mentioned online, online group sessions. How, often, how many times a week are you doing Yeah, that? well, look, as things are changing, um, more and more sessions are coming on board. But um, right now, it was actually swim bands were the first sessions to get up. Uh, strength sessions are, are now running, um, which are all just floor based from home, no equipment at this stage. Uh, we'll build into TheraBands, et cetera, later. Um, and, you know, Zoom rides are next. And, I mean, this is how quick things are moving. I, I'm just starting all of this, really. Um, and uh, online, the, the types of sessions I'm creating are a little different. There's no volume builds at the moment. <laughs> You know, I, I'm, I'm working on uh, structures that really uh, allow the athlete to not only get benefit, but enjoy the indoor sessions. Uh, so, uh, you know, like many coaches, I, I use training peaks. So I, I use the workout builder and create sessions that are um, set to the individual's uh, threshold, fitness, heart rate, pace. You know, so um, it, it at least allows them 
to feel a sense of control and uh, and really lock into uh, session builds that have um, variation and different types of uh, focus, I guess, that, that overall lead to progression, not necessarily in volume. Have you yourself also doing doing more one-on-one -on -one online stuff now in this current situation as well with effortless swimming? Uh, not a whole lot at the moment with uh, pools all over the world closed. So we're just, uh, we're kind of in a holding pattern in terms of just uh, giving people things to work on on land until things do open back up. Um, and I think one of the one of the other things that, like you mentioned mobility earlier, it's um, now's a good time just to be able to work on it. So one thing that I've personally been able to have a bit more time doing is at night after dinner, just lying on the floor for an hour with some Netflix on and just start uh, using like the, uh, the hard sort of massage balls um, or just some general stretching, maybe some yoga uh, movements and just working on that mobility now that time is uh, a lot more, there's a lot more of it. So um, like we, we used to do these tests and um, you know, we've worked with some of the, the physios who have worked with the Australian swim team and they've got these seven tests that they take those swimmers through and two of them which i'll, I'll talk about here is um that are probably really important for for triathletes with their swimming one is the thoracic mobility so your ability to basically move your your body side to side just through the uh, the top part of your torso so that thoracic mobility is really important as is your ability to be able to get your hands sort of um, above your or, or back from your your head I'm Helen Walker, I'm a sports physiotherapist working at Physio for Athletes in, uh, in Melbourne and today what we're going to be talking about is the particular flexibility requirements for the, for the swimming strokes. Now in, with swimming you really need to be able to keep a, a hold a good streamlined position so that your head is in line with your uh, torso and your hips and the legs following through there. So a nice long spine and good arm extension. You also need to be able to achieve a good high elbow position so that you can catch the water and exert a, a long full stroke. So what we're going to be doing is running through with Clayton some of the flexibility tests and how much range you require and then later on a little bit on how to go about improving these movements if you need to. So the first step, Clayton, I'd like you to tuck your uh, thumbs in under your armpits and we're going to look at Clayton's high elbow position. So lifting the elbows out to the side and what we'd ideally like to see is an angle of about 140 degrees or so um, from here to here. So Clayton's quite good there but if you if, if we look at the right side compared to the left we can see this is a little bit lower and we'd be asking Clayton to, to stretch this side more so, so that we can even up his flexibility. Once again, the high elbow test. The next test we'll be looking at is upper back rotation, because during the strokes, you need to be able to rotate your shoulders to pull through properly. So sitting tall, please, Clayton, and I'll get you to pop your arms out in front, palms together, during this test, it's really important to keep the hands in the midline and not shift the shoulders to the side. And I'm going to ask you to turn as far as you can go. And we're looking for a 90 degree arc of rotation, equal left to right and the other way. So Clayton has really good rotational range of motion there. Okay, the next test, I get you to come and sit on the end of the couch facing out this way. Now this test, I'll get you to lie down on your back and pull one knee up towards your chest. And what we're looking at here is the fall of Clayton's thigh on the, other, on the opposite side. So you really need to hug the knee closer to the chest, looking at this angle, and you want the thigh to fall somewhere below horizontal. If the thigh is sticking up in the air like that. This means the hip flexor is tight and you need to work on that flexibility. Let's have a look at the other side. For those doing this at home, you can easily do this test off the edge of a bed. So hugging the knee up to the chest once again and letting the leg 
relax. You can see on this side that Clayton's thigh is up above horizontal slightly. That's telling me that his hip flex is a little bit tight and he needs to stretch that area. I'll get you now to move up the couch, please. Lying on your back. Yep. And what we're going to do here is have a look at Clayton's shoulder external rotation range of motion. And we need the, uh, the arm at a 90 degree angle to the body. And I'm going to get you to rotate back as far as you can go. And that's lovely range of motion there because Clayton's able to rotate his forearm down below horizontal. If the forearm is sitting up above, horizontal that means he's too tight and he'll need to stretch through his pecs. So that looks really good. A very simple test which is often forgotten in swimming is ankle point. You really need to be able to point those toes and ankles down to get a good relaxed foot during the kick and ideally we'd like an angle of 180 degrees there. The last test, and perhaps one of the most important, is the streamline test. So I'll get you to roll over onto your stomach. To do this test, get you to just move down the couch a little bit. And lying down with your chin down on the couch, eyes forward. When we're testing here, we get the arms extended and the thumbs linked together. You can do this test at home, on the floor. And the idea here is to keep the chin in contact with the floor, the chest, the hips, the legs down, and lift your arms up, then Clayton, as high as you can go. And once again, and just chin forward, cheating a little bit there. So keep that chin in line. And we can see that Clayton's getting a nice angle above the horizontal. So, and relax. And I'll just repeat that again, lifting up. This is horizontal. Ideally, you'd like to hit that, that mark. Anything above horizontal is excellent. Note there that Clayton's keeping the rest of his body down. So it's selective flexibility through this area, um, reflecting that Clayton has good length through his lats and his pecs and really good strength through the back muscles. Okay, now what we're going to do is talk about some things that you can do yourself to help improve your flexibility or your strength. Um, for, for those things you've identified during your testing that you, you might need to work on. Um, you'll need a, a trigger ball and a foam roller is also really handy. So we're going to be working here with Annabelle and the first thing I'm going to get Annabelle to do is a stretch to improve her ankle point. So if you, if you go back and remember that um, we wanted a, a, nine, a one, 180 degree angle so the easiest way to do this is to place the foot straight, make sure they're not turned in, otherwise that will hurt your ankles, and then just gently rock back. You can take the weight on your hands, leaning back so the feet are forced into a pointed position and you get a good stretch across the front of the ankle joint. If you get any pain, please stop this particular stretch and um, seek some advice from your healthcare professional. The next stretch that we'll do is facing this way, please, Annabelle. Yep. And we're going to do a hip flexor stretch. So I'll ask you to put one leg up. Okay. Reach your arms up into streamline. So Annabelle, attention to detail with this particular stretch is really important. So I want you to lengthen through your spine, um, nice and tall, and then tuck your bottom under so that you're opening up the front of the hip and getting a stretch in your hip flexor. Can you feel that? And if, if that's not stretching enough, you can lean away to increase the stretch. So once again, the key points here are to keep the spine long and in alignment and tuck the bottom under. All right, next thing we'll do is in side lying and we're going to do an exercise to improve the upper back rotation mobility. So I'd like you to lie on your side, arms out in front and knees bent up to 90 degrees, hips to 90 degrees, long spine again. And Annabelle, I'm going to ask you to reach forward with that top hand, bring the arm up to vertical, then the arm stays in line with the shoulders. It's not to rotate behind the line of the shoulders. 
and rotate your rib cage backwards. So this is a really nice upper back mobility exercise. Once again, keeping the arm in line with the shoulders and returning to the start position and reaching forward and up to vertical. Arm in line with the shoulders and rotating the rib cage back. So the movement is occurring from the upper back, not the low back. How does that feel? Good. and trying to ro rotate further on each rotation and you'd want to be doing 10 on each side. Okay, now lying on your back please and I'll get you to lie on the foam roller all the way up, head up the top and your bottom up on it. So just scoot up on the roller, good work. Starting with your arms up vertical and we're going to do a pec stretch keeping your spine long and then dropping the arms back so you're opening up through your chest till you get a stretch through the front of the shoulders there. Holding that for about 30 seconds and repeating five times. If you're someone who's particularly forward through the shoulder, yep, you can start this particular exercise with the elbows down by your side here and then rotating out that way and this will help open up and stretch a little bit more through the pec minor. So you'll feel this stretch in a different part of the chest muscles. And relax. Now we're going to turn the foam roller horizontal and have that underneath your shoulder blades here. So mid back and streamline arms reaching over. So I want you, Annabelle, just to Check your position and scoot up on the roll other way a little bit. And here, trying to work on keeping your low back flat. So flatten the low back down, head up in line. So don't drop your head back and stretching so that the upper back only is arching over the roller. Once again, holding for 30 seconds, about five repetitions. And up you get there. And I'll get you to now turn around and face the roller and placing the palm up and slightly across the body with a straight arm and roll that out, dropping your bottom down until you feel a stretch through the lat. You'll notice with the lat muscle, if you want to stretch it effectively, you can have your palm down or your palm up. Once again, keeping your spine long and holding that position to get a really good stretch. You should feel it in this area and relax. So these stretches can be performed um, before or after training and really important to, to work on that flexibility so you can get into the positions you need to get into when you're swimming. This is what we call a trigger ball and we use it to perform self-massage techniques to the muscles around the body that work hard but particularly in swimming we use it around the shoulder. So what we're going to do is demonstrate with Annabelle here is leaning down, lying back on the trigger ball, putting the trigger ball under the upper trapezius muscle and rolling around. When you're using the trigger ball, it's important to move on top of it until you find the point that's particularly tender and then hold the pressure on that spot for about 10 seconds till it eases off and then repeat the process. So the important muscles to work on in, in, uh, for the swimming shoulder is the upper trapezius, and I'll get you to sit up there, moving down to lower trapezius, once again rolling around on the ball, finding that sore spot. Have you got that there, Annabelle? Yes. And um, holding that for 10 seconds till the soreness eases off. Now I'm going to get you, we'll switch to the opposite shoulder and the most important muscles to work on are the rotator cuff muscle groups which sit on the back of the shoulder blade here in this triangle. Usually swimmers are quite familiar with this particular muscle group and lying on that shoulder with the trigger ball underneath, lifting your arm up into some elevation because remembering in swimming we're always working with the arms up high, rolling around till you feel the tender and tight spot and holding that and in this way you can do some self massage for the rotator cuff muscles. The final group which is really good to work with is if you lie on your tummy there please Annabelle 
the pec muscles just in this corner here, arm out to the side a little and rolling around till you find the tender spot. If it's too uncomfortable uh, with your body weight on the trigger ball, you can always do this up against a, a wall so you can control the amount of pressure that you're putting on there. So they're the different stretches and mobility exercises that you can do regularly to improve your flexibility for swimming. It's really important though that you do them often, either before or after training. Things will just hold pattern and um, from there you can really drive into developing your skills and form, uh, your strength um, and you can look after your aerobic base builds later. You know, we, we don't have racing for quite a while now. You, you don't have to worry about volume. Um, it's really about just setting up those skill pieces like we spoke about in uh, this chat. Uh, working on isolation and uh, mobility and flexibility and getting all those little bits that'll ensure you've got a, a strong body for years to come. Uh, and in terms of... Uh you know, what else you can work on. You've got time there that might be dead time where you're not doing much where, that you can turn into productive time. And that can certainly be mobility. Um, and often at night it, when you're just uh, winding down from the day. So um, what we will send through is just a couple of uh, really simple stretches and uh, things that you can improve your mobility. For your swimming, that you can get into uh, those positions that we want a lot easier. Um, and, and that's going to help you going forwards. Yeah, so I'm going to provide some videos that the guys will get uh, that you can use to do land-based land work that's not necessary with bands, but more using your body that you can do um, anywhere and you don't really need any equipment. But I'd just like to t make this point that, and it sort of goes along the lines of what other people have said, but in a different way, is take this as an opportunity, as a positive in life that, you're not having to get up at zero dark hundred in the morning and go to a pool and swim in the cold. Use it as an opportunity to maybe recover a bit, sleep a bit more, and use that time to focus on aspects that you haven't focused on before, like strength training or preparing better meals or getting more sleep or spending more time with your family. Because we all know as triathletes, sometimes our sport takes a more important role than it really should. So I'm not gonna talk about all the other things the guys have said, but just think about that. Then you have a different perspective on what has happened to us now and just accepting it and getting some positivity out of it. I think the interesting thing too is, you know, they, these are all things that can be done in your home. So it's, you know, 99% of people are, are in a home work office environment now. So it's, you can't sit in front of your desk. You don't do it in your normal day job from whether it be, you know, eight in the morning till six at night. You, you have little mini breaks all day. You, you mentally need them to be able to stay focused and, and, you know, be current at the task at hand. So these, these are things we're talking 15 minute blocks where, it may be you just need to get up and stretch and get away from your desk, your computer, what you're thinking about and, and you know, de-stress for 15 minutes. You know, jump out in the backyard, go into the spare room, um, put up the cords, put down the stretch mats, use your roller. Um, as I said, these are great things you can do, whether it be mid-morning, you know, during a lunch break quickly or, you know, uh, an easy afternoon break as well. It's easy to incorporate these things into the middle of your day now. Um, we don't have commutes to and from work. Um, the the time, extra time available during the day for most people has actually increased.